Discourse on Method, etc., etc., by Rene Descartes, Part 4. I do not know whether I ought to tell you about the first meditations I engaged in there, for they are so metaphysical and so out of the ordinary that perhaps they will not be to everyone's liking. And yet, in order that it should be possible to judge whether the foundations I have laid are sufficiently firm, I find myself, in some sense, forced to talk about them. For a long time I had noticed that in matters of morality, one must sometimes follow opinions that one knows to be quite uncertain, just as if they were indubitable, and has, and has been said above. But because I then desired to devote myself exclusively to the search for the truth, I thought it necessary that I do exactly the opposite, and that I reject as absolutely false everything in which I could imagine the least doubt, in order to see whether, after this process, something in my beliefs remained that was entirely indubitable. Thus, because our senses sometimes deceive us, I wanted to suppose that nothing was exactly as they led us to imagine. And because there are men who make mistakes in reasoning, even in the simplest matters in geometry, and who commit paralogisms, judging that I was just as prone to err as any other, I rejected as false all the reasonings that I had previously taken for demonstrations. And finally, considering the fact that all the same thoughts we have when we are awake can also come to us when we are asleep, without any of them being true, I resolved to pretend that all the things that have ever entered my mind were no more than the illusions of dreams. But immediately afterwards, I noticed that, while I wanted thus to think that everything was false, it necessarily had to be the case that I, who was thinking this, was something. And I noticed that this truth, I think, therefore I am, was so firm and so assured that all the most extravagant suppositions of the skeptics were incapable of shaking it. I judged that I could accept it without scruple as the first principle of the philosophy I was seeking. <clears throat> then, examining with attention what I was, and seeing that I could pretend that I had no body, and that there was no world nor any place where I was, I could not pretend, on that account, that I did not exist at all, and that, on the contrary, from the very fact that I thought of doubting the truth of other things, it followed very evidently and very certainly that I existed. Whereas, on the other hand, had I simply stopped thinking, even if all the rest of what I had ever imagined had been true, I would have had no reason to believe that I existed. From this I knew that I was a substance, the whole essence or nature of which is simply to think, and which, in order to exist, has no need of any place, nor depends on any material thing. Thus this I, that is to say, the soul through which I am what I am, is entirely distinct from the body, and is even easier to know than the body. And even if there were no body at all, it would not cease to be all that it is. After this, I considered in general what is needed for a proposition to be true and certain, for since I had just found one of them that I knew to be such, I thought I ought also to know in what this certitude consists. And having noticed that there is nothing at all in this I think therefore I am, that assures me that I am speaking the truth, except that I see very clearly that, in order to think, it is necessary to exist. I judge that I could take as a general rule that the things we conceive very clearly and very distinctly are all true, but that there is merely some difficulty in properly discerning which are those that we distinctly conceive. Following this, reflecting upon the fact that I doubted and that, as a consequence, my being was not utterly perfect, for I saw clearly that it is a greater perfection to know than to doubt, I decided to search for the source from which I had learned to think of something more perfect than I was, and I plainly knew that this had to be from some nature that was in fact more perfect. As to those thoughts, I had of many other things outside me, such as the heavens, the earth, light, heat, and a thousand others. I had no trouble at all knowing where they came from, because, noticing nothing in them that seemed to me to make them superior to me, I could believe that, if they were true, they were the dependencies of my nature, insofar as it had some perfection, and that, if they were not true, I obtained them from nothing. That is to say, they were in me because I had some defect, 
But the same could not hold for the idea of a being more perfect than my own, for it is a manifest contradiction to receive this idea from nothing, and because it is no less a contradiction that something more perfect should follow from and depend on something less perfect than itself, I could not obtain it from myself. It thus remained that this idea had been placed in me by a nature truly more perfect than I was, and that it had that it even had within itself all the perfections of which I could have any idea. That is to say, to explain myself in a single word, it was God. There must be a God. To this I added that, since I knew of some perfections that I did not at all possess, I was not the only being that existed. Here, if you please, I shall freely use the terminology of the school. But that of necessity, there must be something else more perfect upon which I depended, and from which I had acquired all that I had. For, had I been alone and independent of everything else, so that I had had from myself all that small amount of perfection in which I participated in the perfect being, I would have been able, for the same reason, to have from myself everything else I knew I lacked, and thus to and thus to be myself infinite, eternal, unchanging, all-knowing, all-powerful, in short, to have all the perfections I could deserve to be in God. For, following the reasons I have just gone through, in order to know the nature of God, so far as my own nature was capable of doing, I had only to consider, regarding all the things of which I found in myself some idea, whether or not it was a perfection to possess them. And I was assured that none of those that indicated any imperfection were in God, but that all others were in him. Thus I saw that doubt, inconstancy, sadness, and the like could not be in God, since I myself would have been happy to be exempt from them. Then, besides this, I had ideas of a number of sensible and corporeal things, for even if I were to suppose that I was dreaming and that everything I saw or imagined was false, I could still not deny that the ideas of these things were truly in my thought. But since I had already recognized very clearly in myself that intelligent nature is distinct from corporeal nature, taking into consideration that all composition attests to dependence, you guys are and, that dependent, and that dependence is manifestly a defect, I judge from this that being composed of these two natures could not be a perfection in God, and that, as a consequence, God was not thus composed, but that, if there are bodies in the world, or even intelligences, or other natures that were not at all entirely perfect, their being had to depend on God's power in such wise that they could not subsist without God for a single moment. After this, I wanted to search for other truths, and, having set before myself the object dealt with by geometers, I conceived of as a continuous body, or a space indefinitely extended in length, breadth, and height or depth, divisible into various parts, which could have various shapes and sizes, and which may be moved or transposed in all sorts of ways, for the geometers assume all this in their objects, I went through some of their simplest demonstrations. And having noted that the great certitude that everyone attributes to these demonstrations is founded exclusively on the fact that they are plainly conceived, following the rule that I mentioned earlier, I also noted that there was nothing at all in them that assured me of the existence of this object. For I saw very well that if one supposed, for example, a triangle, it was necessary for its three angles to be equal to two right angles, but I did not see anything in all this to assure me that there was any such triangle existing in the world. On the other hand, returning to examine the idea I had of a perfect being, I found that existence was contained in it, in the same way in which the equality of its three angles to two right angles is contained in the idea of a triangle, or that the equidistance of all its parts from the, its center is contained in the idea of the sphere, or even more plainly still, and that consequently it is at the very least, just as certain that God, who is a perfect being, exists as any demonstration in geometry could be. But what brings it about that there are many people who are persuaded that it is difficult to know this, and also even to know what their soul is that they never lift their minds above sensible things, and that they are so accustomed to consider nothing except by imagining it, which is a way of thinking appropriate for material things, that everything unimaginable seems to them unintelligible?
This is obvious from the fact that even philosophers take it as a maxim in the schools that there is nothing in the understanding that has not first been in the senses, where it is nevertheless certain that the ideas of God in the soul have never been in the senses. And it seems to me that those who want to use their imagination in order to grasp these ideas are doing the very same thing as if, in order to hear sounds or to smell odors, they wanted to use their eyes. There is just this difference. The sense of sight assures us no less of the truth of its objects than do the senses of smell or hearing, whereas neither our imagination nor our senses could ever assure us of anything if our understanding did not intervene. Finally, if there still are men who have not been sufficiently persuaded of the existence of God and of their soul by means of the reasons I have brought forward, I very much want them to know that all the other things of which they think themselves perhaps more assured, such as having a body, that there are stars and an earth and the like, are less certain than God. For although one might have a moral assurance about these things, which is such that it seems one cannot doubt them without being extravagant, still, when it is a question of metaphysical certitude, it seems unreasonable for anyone to deny that there is not a sufficient basis for one's being completely assured about them, when one observes that while asleep one can, in some fashion, Imagine that one has a different body, and that one sees different stars and a different earth, without any of these things actually being the case. For how does one know that the thoughts that come to us in dreams are any more false than the ones that come to us in the day, given that they are often no less vivid and explicit? And even if the best of minds study this as much as they please, I do not believe they can give any reason sufficient to remove this doubt, unless they presuppose the existence of God. For, first of all, even what I have already taken for a rule, namely that the things we very clearly and very distinctly conceive are all true, it is assured only for the reason that God is... Dang. <laughs> Could you hear that? I don't know. Anyways. <clears throat> for, first of all, even what I have already taken for a rule, namely that the things we very clearly and very distinctly conceive are all true, is assured only for the reason that God is or exists, and that he is a perfect being, and that all that is in, in us comes from him. It follows from this that our, our idea or notions being real things and coming from God cannot, in all that is clear and distinct in them, be anything but true. Thus, if we quite often have ideas that contain some falsity, this can only be the case with respect to things that have something confused or obscure about them because in this respect they participate in nothing. That is, they are thus confused in us only because we are not perfect. And it is evident that it is no less a contradiction that falsity or imperfections as such proceeds from God than that truth or perfection proceeds from nothing. But if we did not know that all that is real and true in us comes from a perfect and infinite being, however clear and distinct our ideas were, we would have no reason that assured us that they had the perfection of being true. But once the knowledge of God and the soul has thus made us certain of this rule, it is very easy to know that the dreams we imagine while asleep ought in no way to make us doubt the truth of the thoughts we have while awake. For if it did happen, even while we sleep, that one had a very distinct idea, as for example if a geometer found some new demonstration, one's being asleep would not prevent it from being true. And as to the most common error of our dreams, which consists in the fact that they represent to us various objects in the same way as our external senses do, it does not matter that it gives us occasion to question the truth of such ideas, since they can also deceive us quite often without our being asleep, such as when those with jaundice see everything as yellow, or when the stars or other very distant bodies appear to us much smaller than they actually are. For finally, whether awake or asleep, we should never allow ourselves to be persuaded except by the evidence of our reason. And it is to be observed that I say, of our reason, and not of our imagination, or of our senses. Even though we see the sun very clearly, we should not on that account judge that it is only as large as we see it. And we can well imagine distinctly the head of a lion grafted onto the body of a goat, without having to conclude that for that reason there is a chimera in the world. For reason does not at all dictate to us that what we thus see or imagine is true. But it does dictate to us that all our ideas or notions must have some foundation of truth, 
For it would not be possible that God, who is all-perfect and all-truthful, would have put them in us without that. And because our reasonings are never so evident nor so complete while we are asleep as while, they are, while we are awake, even though our imaginations while we are asleep are sometimes just as vivid and explicit as those we have while we are awake, or even more so, reason also dictates to us that our thoughts cannot all be true. Since we are not all perfect, what truth there is in them must infallibly be encountered in those we have when we are awake rather than in those we have in our dreams. End of part four.